All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, noting your interest in the hostage policy review uh, that, uh, that was announced today, uh, I have brought with me uh, today Lisa Monaco, who is the President's top uh, counterterrorism uh, advisor. Uh, Lisa was instrumental uh, in the completion of this report uh, and in leading the broader uh, interagency effort that took a look at this issue. So uh, you have all heard from the President uh, already on this. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll call up Lisa and we'll go straight to your questions on this topic. She's only got about 10 or 15 minutes before she needs to move on. Uh, but we'll take the questions on this topic first, and then we'll let her go, and uh, I can handle the uh, range of other questions you may have. Okay? So, Lisa, why don't you come on up? Thank you. Um, Mr. McCary, do you want to get started? Sure. Thank Good you. afternoon. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so, as I understand it, the longstanding U.S. policy against negotiating a hostage ransom by the government as an entity is still forbidden. No concessions. But the government will facilitate families if they choose to pay a ransom. If I'm a bad guy in the Middle East, is that a distinction with the difference? Because either way, if I take an American, I'm going to <coughs> pay. So I want to be very clear uh, about what was said today, and the President was very clear just now, uh, and he was very clear with the families. Uh, the United States government's policy of no concessions, providing no concession uh, to those who take hostages, stands. That continues to be the policy of the U.S. government. What we did today and what we've done as a result of this review is to clarify that no concessions does not mean no communications. And unfortunately, uh, that uh, had uh, needed clarification, uh, and that, was, that came through loud and clear uh, in the review that we did. With respect to your question about whether or not that's a distinction, uh, I appreciate that critique and I understand uh, that uh, analysis. Uh, but I think what is very important and what the President said both to the families with whom he met earlier today uh, and in the Roosevelt Room today is that we will not abandon families. We are going to work with them. And I do want to take issue with the term facilitate. The government will not facilitate the payment of a ransom. What we will do, however, is work with families to try uh, and advise them, to give them the benefit of our best advice. But we will not abandon them when they make very hard decisions. And we will be guided by a focus on their security uh, and to ensure they're not victimized further as they're going through the most horrific uh, situation that they'll probably ever uh, endure. Okay. Roberta? Um, the President said that families were rightly skeptical. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what his meeting with them was like. How many families did he meet with? any families that you can mention in particular, what, what did they tell him, what kind of reaction did they have, and did he ask them to stand behind him or with them as he spoke to us to, to tell us the results of this? So uh, the President met today with uh, about 40 uh, former hostages and families of former and current hostages. Uh, and he met with them in what, as he acknowledged, was a very emotional meeting. Uh, I and a number of my colleagues from around the government spent uh, several hours uh, with these same families and former hostages yesterday. Uh, what we did was we went through and the President uh, continued to describe uh, the changes we are making, uh, the, uh, the review that he ordered and the policy directive that he signed and the executive order that he signed. Uh, he fielded questions uh, about the review, about the process. And about the accountability uh, for making sure that we implement uh, these uh, changes. What was very clear is that uh, families want to make sure they continue to be partners in this effort and to continue to feed in to the process and make sure that we're implementing. Was he hoping that you stood with him when he talked to uh, the cameras? No, this was, uh, this was uh, the time with the families was about hearing from them, hearing their questions, hearing their concerns. Uh, and he had already met with them and described and made his statements and heard from them, uh, and then he made his public statement. So they were very separate events. Jim. Uh, Lisa, the President pointedly noted that nobody has been prosecuted mm -hmm. for pursuing a ransom option. And, and I'm wondering if that becomes uh, a signal uh, to potential hostage takers, pirates, et cetera that it is okay to, that he, they will get some kind of remuneration if they, if they kidnap someone? <coughs> and does it create this kind of bifurcated system where private citizens who may become hostages and <coughs> can pursue that path 
soldiers who are captured can get can be part of a swap as bird dollars. But other government officials who are serving in dangerous way may not have the possibility of availing themselves to that kind of exchange. I think what's true is this is a extremely complex environment that we're navigating. And what the president talked about today with the families is we're confronting a hostage-taking environment and a threat from uh, particularly terrorist actors that has changed and is not the same one that we designed our policies for before. Um, the, uh, the statements about no families ever having been prosecuted, those are statements made by the Justice Department, uh, and it's simply a statement of fact. Uh, and as the Justice Department said in the statement I believe they issued today, they do not intend to add to a family's pain as they're going through these ordeals by making threats of prosecution. So does it signal something? I can't speak to that. I can't speak to the motivations of brutal actors that we've seen. Uh, what is also true, though, is uh, the, um, the motivations here include propaganda uh, and sheer brutality and is not always uh, about profit. Michelle. So does this mean that since, since the policy remains the same and there's a reason, an, an ideological and practical reason for that policy, will the U.S. government first try to dissuade families from paying the ransom? Will, will that sort of be the, the first action um, on that issue? And also, um, when you say that, that the government won't facilitate, I mean, we know in the past with the Weinstein case there was a, a facilitation there, but you're also saying that the U.S. government can, can assist with communication. So how do you draw the line between not facilitating a ransom payment but facilitating communication that could be exactly for that reason? So I'll take the last part first, which is to say I'm not going to get into very specific tactics. I think um, nobody here would want me to and to lay bare uh, a playbook uh, for terrorist actors who are out there. What I will say is that there are very good reasons for communication and for helping a family communicate uh, if they need it and if it's part of a plan that the family designs together with the government and with the experts with whom they work. And that's really the goal here. The, what we're trying to put in place is uh, a partnered approach where families said quite clearly to us and have experienced at times, and the President spoke to this, that they felt neglected, they felt abandoned, they felt on the outside of strategies or uh, efforts to recover their loved ones, sometimes not knowing what was happening, sometimes not knowing what that strategy was. What we're trying to put in place here is uh, an environment where they will be part of that process. They will be able to participate in designing that recovery strategy. There will be a single government entity led by a senior responsible official uh, who is charged every day and wakes up every morning seized with the uh, charge to develop those recovery strategies and execute on them and is held accountable. Uh, and every case is going to be different. Major. Lisa, could you address Elaine Weinstein's criticism that she would have preferred to see a White House <coughs> person, and some members of Congress have asked for a White House czar, and I don't need to tell you when the President tried to wrap his arms around a bowl. He brought somebody in, in the White House, directly answerable to him, and to carry out this coordinating role across the government. Why would it not have been better? And what do you tell Elaine Weiss and the members of Congress who far prefer, would prefer that this coordinated effort be orchestrated from the White House? I think what I'd say, Major, is, uh, and look, there are valid ways of going about this, and I understand uh, the perspectives that other people are bringing to it. I think we've worked with a number of folks in Congress on some of this legislation, some of which call for an interagency coordinator, which is exactly what we're doing. But I want to be very clear about the gap that we heard and saw needed to be fi filled very, very importantly. And that is a single place where operationally, and I want to underscore operationally, all elements of the government were coming together in one place, not stovepiped in one agency working in isolation from the other experts in the other agency working in isolation. There needed to be one place operationally where the experts, the investigators, the intelligence analysts, the military personnel all sat together and focused 100 percent of their time on these recovery strategies. That was not happening. And that operational work is not appropriately put in the White House. I think we'd receive other criticism if uh, it was seen that we were trying to run operations out of the White House. 
So you need one operational place, this fusion cell, with a senior official responsible for that to lead it, but populated by all those experts focused on hostage matters 24-7, but making sure they are accountable here at the White House to the President, as he said in his statement, uh, but also uh, to the uh, policymakers who are sometimes going to have to make hard calls. So the operational gap is the one that I think is most urgently filled. Okay. John. So you said this is about communication. So let me just ask you directly, is it illegal for a family to make a payment to a foreign terrorist organization for whatever reason? So I'm not going to give you, I took off my prosecutor hat a few years ago, as many of you know, and I'm not going to make a legal analysis from here. The Justice Department statement that was issued today talks very clearly about the confusion that many um, uh, families felt because of a statute called the Material Support Statute, which does make it illegal for anybody to provide material support in the form of money, guns, you name it, to a designated foreign terrorist organization. The Justice Department also said, however, they have never exercised their prosecutorial discretion to use that statute to prosecute friends or family members of uh, hostages. But isn't it clear, that, if I can just follow up, that the Foley family, for one, has told us that over and over again they were threatened if they attempted uh, uh, to, to make any kind of a payment, they would be prosecuted. Wouldn't it make sense that that's why prosecutions weren't happening? Because families, it was made very clear to them if they did this, <coughs> they could end up uh, uh, being prosecuted for it? I understand that the uh, families have felt that they were threatened, and it is something that should not have happened, which is what the President said today, uh, which is what officials, uh, including from the Justice Department, told the families uh, yesterday, and that that will not happen in the future. Uh, Peter. Lisa, appreciate your time. Very, very simply, the President today said that the U.S. government policy will remain the same because he said ransom risks endangering more <laughs> Americans and it funds terrorism that we're trying to stop. But ransom money is ransom money, whether paid by the government or paid by individual families. So doesn't this announcement today risk endangering more Americans overseas? So uh, I understand that critique. Here's what I think is different, which is to say the U.S. government policy is no concessions. That's ransoms. That's other policy concessions. There's a whole number of levers or issues that could be on the table if it's an issue of the U.S. government providing that concession, whether it's money and the seemingly vast uh, resources at the government's disposal, uh, or a policy concession, or a policy change, or a pledge not to undertake some type of foreign policy or military action. All of those things would be in the realm of a U.S. government concession that are simply not on the table and will not be on the table. But just very simply, doesn't that money, regardless, that money, the administration agrees, the president said, that and oil basically helps fund these terrorist groups. So providing that money even from families, doesn't that ultimately put a price tag on Americans' heads overseas? There's no doubt that um, the payment of ransoms fuels the very activity that we are trying to stop. Uh, which is why the U.S. government has worked and urged uh, other governments internationally to, uh, to not pay ransoms. At the same time, we've got a responsibility to stand with families as they make the most difficult decisions that they could ever possibly imagine. And what the President said today is we're not going to abandon them. James, I'll give you the last one. we got a lot to go. Okay, just a few quick uh, items in succession. Mm -hmm. Can we say how many American hostages are being held abroad right now? Uh, it is over 30 right now. And this fusion cell that has been described, uh, you referred to it in operational terms. Uh, if this cell should determine that in the case of a given American hostage, uh, rescue is possible, will that cell have the ability to order an immediate rescue operation without getting it signed off on by the President? And uh, under what uh, rules of engagement will the, the individuals dispatched by this cell operate? So uh, I'm not going to speak to hypotheticals about particular operations, but what is true is that cell, comprised of law enforcement, diplomatic, military, and intelligence personnel, will develop that strategy, will combine all the intelligence that will drive that strategy, whether it's a diplomatic one, whether it's a law enforcement one, whether it's potentially a military operation. 
a decision depending on the nature of that operation. And if it involves sending uh, our military service members into harm's way, that will be done uh, by the President on the recommendation of his uh, military chiefs. And last one. Do you acknowledge that part of the problem here, part of the reason why a review like this ultimately became necessary was because <laughs> the Obama administration had been sending some very badly mixed messages? For example, swapping hostages uh, with, in the Bergdahl case, um, threatening some families with prosecution and not others. Wasn't the Obama administration to some extent part of the problem here? So I would challenge the premise of your question on some of that with specific reference to swapping hostages for Sergeant Bergdahl. As you know, that is not uh, how we evaluated that. But what I will say is, and the President said it to the families and he said it publicly, we did not do right by these families. Uh, and uh, that is what we are here to set right uh, and to try very hard to uh, rectify that and put in place processes where we're going to do better in the future. And that was his pledge to them. Okay. Good way to end. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Well, you know, my balance isn't so great, so. Um, all right, we can uh, now go back to our regular scheduled programming here. Jim, do you want to get us started? Thanks, Josh. Uh, two <coughs> issues. Um, we're going to have a, a final vote in the Senate today on, on trade. And I'm wondering if, um, is this something that the, the President would have been able to accomplish had Democrats uh, retained control of either House of, uh, of Congress? Well, uh, that's, um, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, obviously, the dynamics uh, of this debate would have been different. Uh, I don't know uh, what that would have meant for the outcome. Uh, I think, well, let me say this. I think what is true is that even if uh, Democrats uh, had retained the majority in both houses of Congress, that it would have required a legitimate bipartisan effort uh, to pass this legislation and have it arrive on the president's desk. Uh, and the president is gratified that uh, this is a situation where it appears uh, that uh, Democrats and Republicans are able to work together uh, in pursuit of uh, important legislation. Uh, and again, it's notable that we have uh, Republican majorities in Congress uh, working closely with Democratic minorities in Congress uh, to, build, um, uh, you know, to build bipartisan support for legislation that then arrives uh, on the desk of the Democratic president. Uh, that is. Uh, that is the way that, uh, that, uh, that the legislative policymaking process in Washington is supposed to work in an era of divided government. Um, but look, there are still uh, additional votes that have to occur, uh, and you know, the administration is going to continue to play an important role uh, in nurturing uh, that kind of bipartisan spirit uh, to get this across the finish line. It looks like this could possibly be the last real major bipartisan effort, however, you've been uh, the White House and OMB have been sending a flurry of uh, veto threats to uh, to Congress on, on a variety of pieces of legislation, particularly appropriations measures. Uh, so can you say this is essentially the last time that we see a major bipartisan piece of legislation? Uh, well, Jim, those, uh, you know, many of those um, um, uh, letters that have been sent to Congress uh, were raising concerns about legislation that passed almost exclusively along party lines. Uh, and the case that we have made in the context of those particular letters, but also uh, that I've made from here on a number of occasions, that in order to successfully fulfill their responsibility to pass uh, a budget that properly funds um, both sort of our domestic priorities as it relates to our economy and our national security priorities, we're going to need to see Congress act in bipartisan fashion to do it. In order to get 60 votes in the Senate, and in order to obtain the uh, signature of the Democratic president, we need to see some bipartisanship. Uh, and uh, so far in the appropriations process, uh, we've uh, seen a pretty partisan effort. And what we have said we would like to see uh, is Congress engage in an effort that tracks closely with the previous budget agreement. Uh, that was a process that started with uh, uh, Democratic Senator Patty Murray uh, sitting at the negotiating table with Republican uh, uh, committee Chairman Paul Ryan in the House uh, and trying to find bipartisan common ground on a, on a range of, of budget issues. And 
uh, we believe that that uh, is an effective template uh, for how Congress should resolve uh, the current budget situation. And what I would say is that they should, they should begin that process now. Uh, there's no sense, there's no benefit to putting this off uh, until close to the deadline. Uh, I do not believe that that will enhance our ability to reach a bipartisan agreement. Uh, and I also have concerns, based on what we saw last time around, that that could have a negative impact uh, on our economy. Uh, the second thing that's important to note is that the administration, as we were last time, will be involved in those discussions. Uh, and we certainly are going to be very supportive of Democrats uh, who are seeking to advance um, uh, or make sure that uh, progressive values are reflected in uh, whatever bipartisan budget agreement is reached. Uh, I can assure you that neither side is going to get 100 percent of what they want, uh, but we should be able to identify enough common ground well in advance of the deadline uh, that will allow us to ensure that we are uh, fully funding priorities that are critical to the success of our economy and priorities that are critical to our national security. On, on Iran, and you've been asked about this recently, major the other day, but uh, it, it seems that uh, you had previously suggested that the, the, the Supreme Leader's position was in part an attempt to deal with the domestic policy or the domestic politics in, in Iran, a, a hard position to address the hardliners there. But we're just a few days away from a final deal, and he has not backed off. In fact, may even hardened his position on uh, the, the sanctions having to be lifted immediately and uh, issues of inspections of military facilities and so forth. Is, is the, the, that position hardening, is it, is it making it much more difficult for you guys to reach an, uh, an agreement? Can you, can you say whether this has pushed the sides apart, further apart, rather than bringing them closer together? I don't think I'd characterize it that way, but I would, uh, I would acknowledge that there continue to be um, some difficult uh, challenges that have to be met in order to successfully complete uh, an agreement uh, along the time frame that we have set out here. Uh, that all said, what we're most focused on are the um, actions, not the words. Uh, and when I say actions, I mean both the actions of the negotiators as they sit down with the United States and our P5 plus one partners, uh, but we'll also be very attuned to the actions of the Iranians uh, as they implement uh, an agreement if one can be reached. And that's why uh, central to this uh, agreement will be uh, Iran's commitment to cooperate with uh, a set of uh, intrusive inspections to verify their compliance with the agreement. That will be, uh, that will be central to the agreement, uh, and that is consistent with our view that what we're, uh, we're less concerned about the words uh, and much more concerned about the actions. Okay, Roberta. I want to ask about the phone call with President Obama. Okay. And um, the readout said that um, President Obama re uh, reiterated his commitment that um, the U.S. government has not um, spied on his communication since late 13, 2013. Um, but I, I'm wondering if, the pre if President Obama also <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly the way that the readout is. So for those following along at home, I'd encourage you to consult the precise language of the readout. But I apologize for interrupting, Roberta. Please continue. Uh, did President Obama acknowledge that there were times when um, the U.S. government um, observed, surveilled, spied on, choose your word, President Hollande's communications between 2006 and 2012, did, and did, if so, did he apologize for that? Uh, Roberta, I can tell you that in the uh, conversation that the President had with President Hollande today, uh, the President was very clear about the fact that the United States uh, does not target and will not target the communications uh, of the President of France. Uh, and this is consistent with the conversation that President Obama had with President Hollande uh, during uh, President Hollande's visit to uh, Washington, D.C. last year, uh, a little over a year ago. Um, you know, we've been very clear that uh, foreign intelligence activities uh, are only conducted when there is a specific validated national security interest involved. Uh, and that is true uh, both when it comes to uh, uh, the leader of a country, but also when it comes to the citizens of a country. Uh, and the fact is, the United States and France have a very important uh, security relationship. Uh, and uh, the United States has gone to great lengths to ensure that we are uh, sharing uh, our special capabilities uh, with France in a way that has very real implications uh, for the national security 
uh, of France and for the people of France. Uh, we value the strong alliance. Uh, and um, you know, there, are, uh, there is obviously a very uh, persistent extremist terrorist threat inside of France right now. And uh, obviously that is something that uh, uh, the French people and the French government takes very seriously. Uh, and we are pleased that the United States, uh, given our special relationship and given our unique capabilities, uh, that we can substantially contribute to their effort to keep that country and the citizens of France safe. I believe the tense was does not target. Um, and I'm wondering if, the pres if President Obama um, spoke about did not, like things that happened before that point in the past. I, I don't have any, any more details uh, to share about their private conversation. Okay, Michelle. The French summoned the U.S. ambassador over this. There have been some pretty strong words issued by uh, current and former leaders of France. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the call with Hollande sort of settled that enmity, or um, can, you, can you tell us about the outcome of that call and tone? Well, I guess the other thing I would point out, uh, Michelle, and you guys have footage of this, so I'd encourage you to go take a look, uh, at the news conference that President Hollande convened here with President Obama in the White House last year, uh, this particular issue came up. Uh, and both, and President, uh, and it was a question um, that was uh, asked directly of President Obama, uh, but uh, President Hollande uh, himself took the opportunity to weigh in. Uh, and uh, the, the central to his answer was this quote, mutual trust has been restored, and that mutual trust must be based on respect for each other's country. Uh, so, um, that is mutual trust that was reiterated in the context of a short telephone conversation that occurred between President Obama and President Hollande uh, already today. And does the U.S. feel that France has spied on the U.S. in the past? Well, again, for information about uh, uh, France's national security activities, I'd encourage you to ask them. Okay, back to the subject <laughs> of uh, the hostage, <laughs> hostage policy review. Um, it, it was a question I asked before, but, but she she wasn't able to answer it okay. in that time frame. But I can take a shot at it. Okay, so is the government then in dealing with these families initially, because of the U.S. policy that is unchanged, going to try to dissuade them from paying ransoms? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, Lisa, I, like Lisa, uh, I'm going to be reluctant to talk about any uh, individual conversations that we have uh, with families. But what is clear in the review and is clear from the President's comments mm -hmm. Uh, is that the U.S. government feels an important obligation to the families of American citizens who are going through this terrible ordeal. Uh, and that obligation is to support them, uh, to try to protect for their safety and their security, to prevent them from being further victimized, uh, and to use every element of the capabilities of the U.S. government to try to rescue their loved one. Uh, and we have a variety of tools that can be used in this effort. And it's not just military tools. It's diplomatic tools. Uh, there are certain intelligence capabilities that we have that can be supportive uh, of this effort. Uh, and that's why the, this uh, review uh, is focused on making sure that we're properly integrating and coordinating uh, the efforts of the federal government to make sure that we are maximizing the likelihood uh, of a positive outcome. But you have to understand that it seems like this important policy of the U.S. government, uh, the policy by which you've tried to persuade other governments to do the same, just doesn't apply to families because they're families. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, I, I do think, um, I do think that it, uh, it does, Michelle, if you uh, understand as the president does. Uh, that the federal government, the United States government, has a particular responsibility to support and not abandon families who are going through a terrible ordeal like this. Uh, and uh, the president is serious about uh, ensuring that our government uh, response is oriented in a way to both effectively communicate with the family, uh, to make sure they're getting relevant information in a timely fashion, but also to make sure that they're not further victimized given their vulnerable situation. So uh, can we say that U.S. policy does not apply to individuals when they have a, a family member who is held hostage? Well, when you say policy, tell me what you mean. Uh, they mean the no concessions policy? Yeah, sorry. Uh, what we're suggesting is that the no concessions policy is something that has uh, 
long applied to the efforts of the United States government to secure the release of U.S. citizens uh, being held hostage. Uh, and as Lisa pointed out, there are, are, are often hostage takers that are seeking things uh, beyond just a ransom. Uh, and w we've been clear that the United States government, uh, including ransoms, will not be in a position uh, of offering concessions to hostage takers. But isn't the U.S. sort of implicitly saying that, okay, ransoms can work. If you want to do that, you can do that. But you're sending that message globally now that in some cases, ransoms can work, and we're not going to prosecute you for it, and we're going to allow you to do that. I think what uh, the message that we're sending is that the government of the United States of America stands squarely behind uh, American families who are in the unthinkable position of trying to do everything that they possibly can to try to se secure the safe uh, return of their loved one who's being held hostage overseas. Okay. Mike. Two, two quick questions about Friday, if I might. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about kind of the president's intentions when he goes to South Carolina in delivering the eulogy? Does he view the eulogy as primarily a kind of emotional moment, or does he view it as a time to talk about policy, gun policy, uh, gun control policy, uh, Confederate flag issues that have arisen from all, all of this? Or, or is it a mix of both? Um, and then second, if you could talk a little bit about logistics of the president reacting to what might be a Affordable Care Act decision on Friday and how that might work. Okay. Uh, Mike, I can tell you that the, that the president's remarks for Friday are still in the early stages of being written. Uh, I can say as a general matter that the uh, focal point of the president's remarks will be to pay tribute uh, to um, Reverend Pinckney uh, and the eight others whose lives were lost uh, in that terrible attack um, just over a week ago. Uh, a week ago today, obviously, but at that point it'll be a little over a week ago. The, um, and uh, the remembering those individuals and celebrating uh, their lives uh, will be uh, the focus of the President's remarks. Um, but we'll have, we, we'll, we'll try to get you some more detail in advance of Friday. <coughs> but I guess without detail, can you get, mm -hmm. can you give us a sense of whether he intends to also use that moment to talk about, again, this question of, of the broader questions that, that have been raised by the, by the killings, the gun control issues and others? Well, there's obviously been a, 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 a robust public debate on a variety of issues that has uh, emerged in the aftermath of uh, this terrible uh, incident. Um, uh, at this point, again, it's hard for me to rule out the President mentioning uh, some aspects of that debate uh, at this point because it's so early in the in the writing process, uh, but I do feel confident in telling you now that the, f the focus of his remarks uh, will be on uh, celebrating the life of uh, Reverend Pinkney, Pinkney uh, and the eight others who were lost that night. Okay, and then on the logistics. And on the logistics. Uh, it's my understanding that the President's departure on Friday uh, will not be until uh, after the uh, typical 10 a.m. time frame in which Supreme Court decisions are announced. We expect to hear from, if the Affordable Care Act is that day, would we expect to hear from the President either way, whichever way it goes? Uh, it's certainly possible, and it sounds like we would have that capability based on the President's current travel schedule, uh, but, um, uh, but I would make that commitment to you at this point. Okay. Uh, John, in the back. Thank you, Josh. You've said on three or four occasions that the administration has had no discussions with senators of either party about a contingency plan if King v. Burwell goes uh, on the side of the plaintiff. Uh, accepting that, have you or has the administration had any discussion with governors of states who would be impacted uh, by a hostile decision and with their personal staffs? Well, uh, John, I think what I'd refer you to is actually what uh, senior administration officials have told members of Congress, uh, and I'm referring specifically to testimony from uh, the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, um, uh, Sylvia Burwell, where she indicated that uh, uh, if a, uh, some kind of reaction uh, is necessary uh, in the unlikely event of a, an adverse ruling before the Supreme Court, uh, that the pressure would be immediately on uh, governors uh, and, or I guess, state officials and uh, Congress 
to try to uh, address the situation. And uh, the fact is, um, this is something that's hard to predict without seeing the ruling. Uh, but again, if there were, in the unlikely event that there were to be a, an adverse ruling, um, you know, we've already indicated that uh, there is no simple, easy fix that can be um, made solely by the executive branch. Uh, and, um, but again, we continue to have um, a lot of confidence uh, in the strength of the legal arguments that were made before the Supreme Court in this matter. Uh, and um, you know, we believe that it, uh, uh, it is very clear uh, what the statute says, uh, and that's why we continue to have confidence in the outcome. Okay, Major. Josh, would it be fair to say that the President's remarks today amounted to an apology for what the administration got wrong in dealing with the hostage families? <laughs> he did not use that word in public, but did he, I wonder, use it when he spoke with the families, either today or in the past? Uh, Major, I, I did not, I was not in the room when the President spoke with the families today. Uh, even if I were, I'm not sure I would have a lot to share about that private conversation. Uh, I think what you can interpret from the President's public comments uh, is that he is very serious about making sure that the United States government uh, is doing right by our citizens, uh, particularly when we're talking about citizens uh, that are enduring a situation as terrible as having a loved one taken hostage. Uh, and the reforms that the President announced uh, that, that, that this review, review group put forward today, that the President discussed today, uh, and um, you know, the, uh, the statement from the Department of Justice uh, about this policy, I think, are uh, illustrative of the effort and the commitment to ensure that we are uh, maximizing the resources of the federal government to try to address the situation uh, and uh, ensuring we are putting, fo putting forward the best possible effort uh, to support these families. Follow up on Michelle's line of questioning. Is it the President's belief that with the fusion cell, the FBI, and a better coordination, there is a higher degree of confidence he hopes to have in the future that hostages will be recovered because the effort will be better and more focused and more aggressive? And secondarily, in conversations with families, the government will convey that ransom should be considered the last resort because so many other efforts are being undertaken? Well, uh, I don't think that I would necessarily describe uh, future efforts as more aggressive, simply because uh, the efforts that have already been taken uh, as it relates to um, previous hostages and even some current hostages uh, are very aggressive. Uh, and the President has demonstrated a willingness on more than one occasion uh, to expend significant government efforts and even to take to expend significant government resources and even to take some significant risks to try to secure uh, the rescue of American citizens. The President you know, has ordered uh, operations uh, in remote places like in Syria and in Yemen to try to uh, rescue American citizens who are being held hostage. I think that reflects a very aggressive effort on the part of the President and his administration to try to rescue American citizens. I think the goal of the reforms that were announced today uh, is to make sure that we are properly integrating and coordinating those efforts so that we can maximize the impact of them. Uh, and I do think there is a sense that by implementing these reforms, we can make uh, these efforts even more effective. And what about ransom as a last resort? Uh, that, I, that's not the way that it's described here. I think the... Uh, the if you're going to have an open, and you've pledged to have an open conversation with families. That's right. You wouldn't suggest that ransom be the first option, would you? Uh, I think what we would say is we would be able to, again, uh, given this uh, refined structure, be able to communicate in as much detail as possible uh, the great lengths that the U.S. government is going to to try to rescue their loved one. I think, to be blunt, I think even the President would admit uh, that in the past that communication has not been nearly as clear as it needs to be. Uh, and. Uh, I do think that as, um, you know, as, as families go through this terrible situation, uh, that this, that clearer communication uh, and the, uh, this reformed structure uh, will give them greater confidence uh, in the ongoing efforts of the U.S. government to rescue their loved ones. Just follow up on Jim's question on Iran. You said you're interested in 
actions, not words. That's right. Is it therefore clear to the negotiators on the U.S. side that what's happening in the negotiating room is different than what the Supreme Leader is saying? And therefore, the negotiators have uh, some latitude to ignore what the Supreme Leader is saying. And what he's saying in public is not being reflected at the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And that those are the actions that you're basing your sense of optimism on this, the potential of obtaining a deal. Well, let me just say, uh, Major, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I have a lot of detail to share about the ongoing negotiations. Um, well, I do, uh, but I'm just unwilling to share uh, a lot about this. But uh, it is an important distinction. Follow up on. And what I what I can say to you, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, is that the negotiations continue to be difficult, uh, but there continues to be uh, a good faith effort on both sides to try to complete them uh, in the timetable that we've laid out. So uh, there's a reason that they continue to negotiate, uh, but I don't want to leave with the impression that all of the difficult challenges have been resolved. Negotiations reflect the framework or the comments in public of the Supreme Leader? Well, uh, what we have said is the only result that we will accept is one that's consistent with the framework. That's not what I asked. Well, uh, I, uh, I understand that, uh, but that's as much as I feel like I can say at this point. Okay. Justin. Um, I wanted to go back to France really quickly. Uh, there's like a long history of French and U.S. industrial espionage dating back to the 80s and 90s when the French were spying on IBM and Texas Instruments and then accused us of spying on their tech industry. And so I'm wondering if under the umbrella of specific validated national security interests, you can rule out the U.S. conducting any sort of industrial espionage on the French, especially tech or uh, defense corporations. Uh, but just let me just reiterate what our policy is, which is that you know foreign intelligence activities are only conducted when there is a specific and validated uh, national security interest involved. Yeah, included which is the, the question, right? So is it? Is well, it but I, I do think it is. I do think it answers your question because you're asking a, you know a specifically about whether or not these kinds of foreign ac intelligence activities are used for some sort of economic or uh, purpose or for financial gain. Or are we uh, just buying on French companies because we think that the technology that they're developing would be useful to our national defense interests? Uh, well, again, I'm trying to be as specific and direct and candid as I can about um, what I think we all know are uh, activities that are not discussed in much detail in public. All right. Um, move to the OPM hack. Uh, I'm wondering why it's been so hard to get to the bottom of how many people's records have been compromised. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of conversation about this on the Hill yesterday, and so I'm wondering what the issue has been and how quickly you think you'll be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Justin, this is a challenge that uh, is not unique to the federal government. Uh, the fact is the private sector has um, worked through this very difficult challenge, too. And it's not, uh, again, it's not unique to the U.S. government in trying to uh, investigate these uh, intrusions. Uh, to determine exactly what happened, to determine who was responsible, and to determine the scope of the breach. Uh, and that takes time. Uh, but what the, uh, I think what our administration has demonstrated already is a serious commitment to trying to be as forthright as possible about what it is that we know. Uh, and, um, you know, what we have announced thus far uh, is that there are uh, upwards of four million uh, U.S. government uh, employees who potentially may have had uh, sensitive information uh, exfiltrated from the OPM system. Uh, we have acknowledged that there is uh, additional activity uh, that could um, uh, uh, lead to the conclusion that uh, additional data is at risk, uh, but this is something that is the subject of an ongoing investigation, and uh, we've been clear that we're going to try to give uh, give people as much insight as possible into that ongoing investigation. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're cognizant of the fact that um, talking in public a lot about the investigation could actually affect our ability to conduct it successfully. Uh, so we're trying to balance all of these things. And I think what is paramount, though, is trying to communicate clearly with those individuals who may be directly affected. Uh, and that, is, uh, that will continue to guide our public communications priorities. Well, lawmakers said yesterday after their classified briefing that they weren't necessarily confident that you guys could get a handle on the entire scope of this. It, are you willing to lay down any kind of markers for when you will be able to tell, even in a classified briefing like there was yesterday, 
Capitol Hill what the kind of size and scope of this uh, of this breach was? Well, I'd refer you to the FBI uh, for that. Again, there are also, I guess, the other point that you are highlighting, which is relevant here, uh, is that our the kind of communications that we have with members of Congress in a classified setting uh, is obviously different than the kinds of conversations we can have publicly. Uh, and so we have gone to great lengths to make sure that we're sharing as much information as possible with members of Congress uh, in a classified setting. That's consistent with uh, the uh, executive branch's um, obligation to cooperate with legitimate congressional oversight. Uh, that's a responsibility that we take seriously, and we have taken that very seriously in this matter. Uh, but um, you know, we're going to continue to be um, mindful of the responsibility that we have to communicate with those who have potentially been affected. Uh, to be as transparent as possible about the ongoing investigation, while also protecting the ability of our investigators to do their important work, too. And one last thing. Um, you kind of implied yesterday that, as part of this dialogue that's going on with the Chinese, that um, issues about cybersecurity would be raised uh, behind closed doors. I'm wondering if the President plans to raise cybersecurity issues when Chinese officials visit the White House later today. Uh, I don't have any uh, aspect of the meeting to preview. Uh, but let's touch base after the meeting, and we may be able to provide you some additional details about their discussion. Mark? Josh, what is the origin of the phrase fusion cell? I've heard of working group. I've heard of task force. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of a fusion cell. I'm not sure of the origin of the word. I think what they're trying to illustrate is that, uh, that uh, they're trying to bring together, essentially to fuse together the efforts of the variety of government agencies that are involved in trying to rescue American citizens. And so that means making sure uh, that the efforts uh, by the intel community uh, are fused together with the efforts of the military, are fused together with the efforts uh, of our diplomatic corps, uh, to make sure that those, uh, that those actions are uh, reinforcing uh, one another uh, and are properly coordinated to maximize the likelihood of success. Are you aware of any other fusion cells in government? <laughs> um, not off the top of my head. but. Um, uh, not off the top we'll of my head. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look at it. And one last thing. Um, on, uh, if the government is giving tacit approval of uh, private family payments uh, in, in terms of ransom to get a hostage back, doesn't that provide an incentive to terror groups to go after not just Americans but wealthy Americans? Yeah. Well, Mark, I think um, there's a pretty significant disincentive that hostage takers have around the world. Uh, that they know if they're going to target U.S. citizens, that the resources of the federal government uh, under the uh, leadership of President Obama uh, will be dedicated to rescuing that American citizen uh, and bringing their hostage taker to justice. Peter. About the OPM hack very quickly, on June 4th when the White House publicly acknowledged a single breach had taken place, was the White House covering up the fact that there was an investigation of a second breach that they were already aware of? Uh, Peter, what we have done at every turn uh, is to try to be as forthright as possible about the status of the ongoing investigation. Uh, and I think what I have also been clear about uh, in talking about this is that there continues to be an ongoing effort to determine the precise scope uh, of this intrusion. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that was true back on June 4th when we first started talking about this publicly, uh, and it's true today. So did the White House know, I guess, there was a second breach all along? Well, again, I, I will let our investigators talk about uh, what they were able to learn uh, and, um, and the decisions they make about when it's appropriate to make information about their investigation public. Okay. All right. James. Uh, one on Iran, and then I want to return to the hostage policy. Okay. Recognizing that you care more about actions than words and that you have the ability to plumb uh, the motivations of the supreme leader. I'm asking you simply to assess for us the words as we have received them from the Supreme Leader. Um, and, uh, and my question to you specifically is, do you recognize that the recent statements of the Ayatollah uh, and the red lines he has drawn, stating them as such, run directly inimical to uh, the things that our negotiators are trying to achieve? Uh, another way of putting it is, do you recognize that if the Supreme Leader means what he says, then these talks are finished. Well, uh, James, uh, again, I guess that's why uh, I think that's why the principle that I have tried to uh, describe is the operative one here, which is that we are very focused on the actions uh, of the negotiators at the negotiating table and uh, of Iran's uh, willingness to live up to the commitments they make if they uh, do eventually make them. I, I guess what I will say is. Uh, 
that we have been really clear about the fact that we're only going to agree to a final um, uh, agreement uh, if it reflects the political agreement that was reached uh, back in the first week of April. Uh, and if that is not something that the Iranians will be able to agree to, then we will not successfully complete the negotiations. On the hostage policy, uh, number one, President Obama in his remarks stated that the fusion cell has been up and running for some period of time already. Why then did we not hear about the appointment of its leader? Uh, tell us the time frame for that appointment and, uh, and, and how that process is being managed right now. Uh, I'm not aware that the leader has been appointed yet, um, but let me, um, uh, let me check on that and we can have somebody get back to you. This is obviously a, a, a process that will be housed at the FBI. Uh, but we'll get with the FBI and determine whether or not this leader has been appointed yet. I think what the President was referring to is there, we recognized at the beginning of this review that there was a need to more uh, effectively integrate the efforts of the federal government. Uh, and what this review did is essentially formalize a process for doing that. No one's been asked yet, in other words, to be the leader? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, so let me, uh, let me follow up with you. Two more. Okay. We have now seen this administration announce publicly that it is going to decline to enforce relevant federal statutes with respect to marijuana. We have seen this administration announce that it is going to decline to enforce relevant federal statutes, uh, statutes with respect to immigration and deportation policy. And today we saw this administration announce it is going to decline to enforce the relevant federal statutes with respect uh, to private payments of money to foreign terrorist organizations. Do you understand how a dispassionate observer could conclude that this president who is the chief enforcer of our, law, our laws, the chief executive of our laws, charged with executing those laws, takes a somewhat cavalier view of the law and sometimes decides it should be enforced and sometimes not. Well, I vigorously disagree with that uh, conclusion, James. What the, the chief law enforcement officer of the United States uh, is the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, and it is the agency that she runs that's responsible for making these prosecutorial decisions. Uh, that's been true of previous administrations, and it's true in this administration as well. There's no pattern there of declining enforce federal statutes. Uh, well, I think the pattern is that there, the prosecutorial decisions uh, are made on a daily basis over at the Department of Justice, absent any uh, political interference. Last one. Give us a sense for, in the course of the President's day-to-day -day schedule, how frequently he is engaged on the issue of American hostages. Is that something he's dealing with every day, once a week? Uh, I, I think it is fair, James, to say that the President is frequently updated uh, on the status of efforts to recover uh, American hostages. Uh, and, you know, obviously the individuals who will be responsible for uh, running the, the fusion cell uh, and responsible for leading this uh, policy group, uh, obviously uh, Lisa Monaco, who was just out here, will be intimately involved in those efforts. And they will make the determination about how frequently uh, it is necessary to update the President on their efforts. Uh, but the President is certainly interested in hearing from them every single time they have an update. Okay. John. Just to follow up on James's question about enforcing laws. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you're saying that the President of the United States, the White House has had nothing to do with <coughs> decisions on the part of this administration not to enforce immigration laws under DACA. Uh, the law under the Defense of Marriage Act earlier in this administration, or uh, marijuana laws that the President, or in this case, the, the President and the White House has had nothing to do with the decisions not to enforce laws in all of those categories? Uh, John, this, the, the tradition that uh, is abided uh, scrupulously by this administration is the same one that was followed by previous administrations, which is that it is, it is the responsibility of the Attorney General, the top law enforcement officer of the United States, to make prosecutorial decisions. Uh, and Loretta Lynch is eminently qualified to do exactly that. Okay. Um, let, let me ask you about, the, the President said that, uh, you know, every effort will, will be made to, to free American hostages, will work with families. All that was announced today, does this apply to Jason Rezaian, Saeed Abedini, and Amir Hekmati, who are being held right now, known to be held right now, uh, in Iran? Mm -hmm. Uh, John, we have uh, had communications uh, with those, uh, with the families of those uh, American citizens. Uh, and uh, we have uh, made sure that they are both aware of these policy changes, but also uh, aware of the ongoing efforts of the federal government to secure their release. Uh, obviously, the efforts to secure their release uh, are different. Uh, they are being held by a foreign government. Uh, that means they face a uh, similarly uh, gut-wrenching, uh, situation for their family, uh, but their legal status is different than somebody who is 
uh, being held hostage by a terrorist organization, for example. Okay, and I just wonder, uh, there, ABC was among uh, a couple of other news organizations that reported back in April that precisely this would happen, that the hostage review uh, would, would recommend uh, using prosecutorial uh, discretion not to threaten families of hostage with prosecution if they pursued ransom. And that was outright denied and said to be false by the National Security Council press office. Why is that? I mean, that's exactly what happened. Well, uh, John, I didn't read the details uh, of the specific ABC report. Uh, I think what we tried to be clear about, and I mentioned this as recently as yesterday, uh, that while the scope of this uh, sp specific hostage review was broad, uh, what was not included in the review was a reconsideration of the federal government's no concessions uh, policy. Uh, and uh, again, I can't speak for all of the back and forth communications, but that is a principle that we outlined from the beginning of this process, and it's one that uh, we're saying here today on the day that the report was released. But back in April when, when this came up, I asked you directly, not, not about U.S. policy about paying ransom, but about the threat threatening families with prosecution. And uh, you said that uh, uh, this was st strictly a matter of the Department of, of Justice to make prosecutorial decisions, and that obviously will not be anything that is decided in the context of this review. Judging from the President's words, uh, it sounds like this was very much part of the review, the idea of, of stopping the, the practice of threatening families with prosecution. That's not going to happen anymore. Uh, but it was a decision that was announced by the Department of Justice in the context of a statement from a Department of Justice spokesperson. So it had nothing to do with this so, review? Uh, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that well, that's that what you said in April. You said this will not be anything that's decided in the context of this review. Uh, I'm saying that it is a decision that was made by the Department of Justice and announced by the Department of Justice for a reason, because that is their purview. But, but as a result of, the, of this review, that th this was part of this review? This was a decision that was made by the Department of Justice. Josh. Uh, Jared, go ahead. Josh, a follow-up to Mike's question <coughs> earlier about the Friday remarks in Charleston. Okay. Uh, President said last Friday that sympathy for victims is not enough. And while you said to Mike that the the that the victims will be the focus of the remarks, can we assume that the President will take his own advice and go beyond sympathy, perhaps into the realm of gun control policy? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what I've uh, said to Mike is that the focus of the President's remarks will be on uh, celebrating the lives of those who were lost. Uh, on that tragic night last week. Uh, for more details of what the president, uh, president's message will be on Friday, I'd encourage you to tune in. Oh, if you want to go further. No pride of authorship no, in the question. No, really, I'm happy. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, some kind of ransom privately, not through the government, be treated differently when it comes to rescue operations by the U.S. government. Just as an example, if, if two comparable situations, people taken under similar circumstances, under similar conditions for similar lengths of time, will the United States prefer the family whose uh, or the hostage whose family didn't pay a ransom and therefore complied fully with U.S. law when trying to effort a, a rescue operation? Yeah, I, uh, Jared, I, that's a hypothetical situation that I'm probably not going to delve into at this no, point. No, I'm asking, so. I'm asking you, you've clearly laid out this change in policy, but you still have the old policy in effect, which is that this is illegal. So what I'm asking is, will families who comply with the law be treated differently when it comes to hostage uh, rescue operations? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I'm not going to get into that. JC. Okay. Um, the decision the president made today articulated by Ms. Monaco, was this decision ta tactical, strategic, or moral overall? Uh, and we say this decision, you mean the? The, the entire thing, the, the executive decision yeah. on, the, on the hostages and the families and the way, the entire, the entire operation. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Lisa was pretty blunt about the fact that there are uh, both strategic, tactical, and moral questions at stake here. Uh, and. Uh, I think it's fair to assume that uh, all of those factors weighed in uh, the conclusion that the review group reached. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of the president and the, his own emotional his feelings about these things, his, his commitment to, to do the right thing, as, as we might want to say. Yeah. Well, look, the, the, the president believes that the U.S. government has a, a particular obligation uh, to American citizens, particularly those uh, who are vulnerable uh, and going through uh, an ordeal as serious and gut-wrenching as uh, having a loved one taken hostage. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure, uh, and this review 
reflects a commitment to making sure that we are maximizing the efforts of the federal government uh, and that we are doing everything we can to do right by the families. Okay, Rebecca. Thanks, Josh. To follow up on gun control, I know the president has said that he doesn't foresee any legislative action being taken in this Congress, but is the White House having conversations with interested lawmakers like Senators Manchin or Toomey who have been talking about resurrecting the background check bill from 2014 about making another push, even a symbolic one? Well, I'm not aware of any high-level conversations that are ongoing, but I think it's pretty clear to uh, anybody that's been uh, following the President's public comments in the last week or so that this continues to be uh, a priority of his. Uh, he was also just as blunt about the fact that uh, the American people are going to need to send a clear message to the United States Congress uh, that this is a priority uh, in order for us to get a different result than the one we got last time that uh, uh, Senators Manchin and Toomey uh, got together to try to advance gun safety legislation. But the White House hasn't spoken with either Manchin or Toomey on their public efforts to resurrect that bill? Uh, I'm not aware of any high-level conversations, uh, but uh, it's difficult for me to uh, account for uh, the telephone use of every single person who works at the White House. So, um, uh, so I wouldn't rule anything out necessarily, but th th there's no, uh, no high-level conversations to tell you about. Thank okay. You. Jim, I'll give you the last one. Oh, thank you. Uh, on the budget negotiations, the President will want uh, revenue in return for any cuts, as in the past, I assume. Do you have any revenue targets in mind? Well, the, I think the most prominent revenue target that we've discussed in the context of the President's State of the Union address and the uh, uh, and the rollout was uh, carrying the uh, or closing the carried interest loophole. Uh, so there are a variety of other ones. We can uh, go back and pull those fact sheets for you to give you uh, some uh, some more details. Uh, the fact is, uh, we have identified uh, revenue targets that would allow us to make a series of critically important investments in a fiscally responsible way. That's certainly the approach the president will advocate and, uh, has advocated for some time and will continue to advocate for. Okay, Steve, you had your hand up for a long time. I didn't mean to skip over you, so I'll give you the last one. Head of OPM. A lot of people in Congress calling for uh, her removal. Mm -hmm. What's the White House's stand on that? Yeah. Uh, she's obviously got a, a very difficult job and a very difficult challenge ahead of her. Uh, and the administration and the president continues to believe that she's the right person for the job. And on uh, another matter, the uh, OMB has uh, stated that it's opposed to the um, uh, parts of the appropriations bill on environment and interior that would uh, make it very difficult for EPA to keep. Uh, pursuing the regulations it has. But there's no veto threat in there. Is the administration not uh, regard that as something that it would uh, veto if necessary? Mm -hmm. so this is a procedural thing, and I may have to follow up with you on it. But if was this a, a piece of Senate legislation? Uh, I think it may have been. And the way that we have uh, done this is that we, as it has moved, as these appropriations bills have moved through the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee process, what we have done is we've written letters to the appropriators to raise specific concerns uh, with the bills that they have um, considered. Uh, but I think consistent with the letters that were sent related to other Senate uh, appropriations subcommittee deliberations, um, it didn't. Uh, in, they, none of them included veto threats, uh, but they rather uh, included a pretty broad enumeration of the concerns that we have with the bills that they uh, marked up. Okay, but we can follow up with you on that. So you're withholding the veto threats until it's in the House? Until, well, until it goes, until it advances to a later stage in the process. So uh, we can follow up. Those who are interested in this, I'd encourage you to check with the OMB. They can uh, help you understand the procedural quirks. What's admittedly true, Steve, and this is something that OMB will also acknowledge, uh, is that uh, on the House side, our approach has been somewhat different, which we've been more blunt about the possible use of a presidential veto uh, in response to a particular um, to the uh, to uh, appropriations proposals that have advanced through the House process. So um, this is complicated. I'm by no means an expert in the appropriations process, but um, I believe that the uh, administration response to this latest uh, environmental appropriations bill is consistent with our response to other uh, appropriations uh, bills that have advanced in the Senate. But we'll follow up with you on that. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.